Hi, my name is Stephanie Woodard. I'm an assistant professor of breast imaging at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I'm going to be talking about breast emergencies. I have no pertinent financial disclosures. I'm the PI of an investigator initiated industry funded study with BRACO. Um, we haven't started funding or recruitment yet. Um, the goals and objectives of this study, after this lecture, the audience should be able to identify common findings that lead patients to the ER for breast related symptoms, feel confident in assessing the ultrasound images of the breast, and then have a plan of action for follow up. So breast emergencies, um, what is a breast emergency? Different people will say different things about what constitutes a breast emergency, mastitis, abscesses, trauma, malignancy. True breast emergencies are very rare. So sometimes based on a patient's clinical presentation or their comorbidities, something may or may not be considered an emergency. Um, these are some examples, neck fash, um, life-threatening trauma, uh, typically the breast is incidental. For instance, if this patient presents with um, an abnormal left breast and an x-ray is done, you see some air in the soft tissues, um, CT is done and you can see air tracking through the subcutaneous fat in the back into the breast. Um, this may be an emergent or urgent um, issue for this patient that just happens to involve the breast. So indications for emergent breast evaluation, breast should be the presenting symptom. You'll often get these um, non-pertinent uh, issues with the breast when a patient presents to the emergency department. Um, and I've had this lump for a while and need to get it checked out is typically not a good indication for an emergent breast evaluation. This is the outline for today. Patient characteristics. So these are important to consider. Um, age, history of breast cancer, breast history, and their medical conditions, and we'll go over these. So age is important, um, but I do want you to realize that breast um, can look very similar, and um, doesn't matter what age a patient is. So all these ultrasound images, they actually are from various patients in different decades. So from age 20 to 70. And if you look at them, they all kind of have a similar sonographic appearance, and it really varies based on the, um, the, con the content of the breast tissue. So tissue characterization of ultrasound um, in the breast is homogeneous fat, homogeneous fibroglandular, and then heterogeneous. So just be aware that some tissue may look a little bit different um, just because of the different uh, background breast tissue. Um, history of breast tissue is or breast cancer is important as well. So for instance, this patient presents um, with a firm palpable area, um, is evaluated in the emergency department, and it's the lumpectomy bed from surgery, could be completely normal. Um, this patient presented several years out from surgery with pain at her lumpectomy site, um, did an ultrasound. Um, this is coarse calcification at the site of her cancer, her, her treated cancer, um, that were dystrophic on mammography. But then adjacent to it was this irregular mass that ended up being a recurrence. Um, so you want to know if the patient's been screening regularly, have they had recent biopsies or surgeries? For instance, this patient presented with a firm tender area, um, but it was only five days after reduction of mammoplasty and it was a large hematoma. Uh, this particular patient presented um, with a very um, tender, red, painful breast. She was seven days after lumpectomy and had a superimposed seroma, uh, superimposed infection on a seroma. So, different presentation, um, different histories, and makes a difference as far as what could be going on in the breast. Medical conditions are important. So um, in uh, emergency radiology, they published uh, a study looking at 581 patients that presented with um, suspe suspicion for abscess um, and did ultrasounds. Actually, 26% 20 of them ended up having an abscess, so the large majority didn't even have any kind of infection. 41% um, were indeterminate. So it's important um, to note that uh, that indeterminate number, a lot has to do with the fact that we can't really do mammographic evaluation and thorough evaluation in the emergency setting. And their overall recommendation was to improve their patient selection. So um, interestingly, I did wanna highlight that they, they noticed 7% uh, of the patients actually ended up with granuluminous mastitis. So it's kind of an uncommon um, finding in the breast, but something to be aware of. Um, pregnant or lactating tissue is really important. So the reason why this is very important is because the tissue has a very bizarre and different appearance. So if you look at normal breast tissue to the left and then to the right, um, the lactating breast, uh, the ducts are engorged. This is typical appearance of milk inside the ductal system. The tissue is a little more homogeneously echogenic, um, so it looks quite different than regular breast tissue. Diabetic, um, knowing if a patient's diabetic is important because there are several conditions that can, uh, can affect the breast and can cause the patient to present. For instance, diabetic nystopathy, which is what this patient presented with, 
Um, it can look like malignancy. It can be very tender. Um, this patient was biopsied and it was proven to be diabetic mastopathy, but it's a, something to be aware of. They can also get um, infection and things like that. Autoimmune diseases are very important as well. So one of um, an uncommon uh, process, but can present with pain and tenderness and a very irregular sonographic exam is lupus. Um, this patient presented with uh, a very firm, um, large uh, right breast with all these different fluid collections, and, um, echogenic surrounding tissue. Again, this was benign, but had a very bizarre appearance and it's important to be aware of medical conditions. Smoking um, has a lot to do with patient presentation in the emergency setting. So um, we know that smokers can develop these chronic subareolar abscesses. You can see this particular patient presented um, for multiple years. This is a five-year span um, with, per, with chronic relapsing um, subareolar abscesses. Um, it's important to know the history of the patient's current presentation. So for instance, if you can, if you can have the tech document, the physical exam findings, if the patient's um, particularly read in one specific spot, um, you want to know how large, if it's symmetric or asymmetric, um, the skin color changes, uh, warmth or drainage. So the next thing is the different modalities and just a couple tips about ultrasound. So some of the things to think about, um, we'll start with the chest wall. Um, it's important when you're um, looking at and evaluating these ultrasound images. In this image on the left, um, there's a picture that includes a very large portion of the chest wall. Um, you want it to look like the one on the right. So you wanna see the chest wall, but you don't want half or three fourths of the image to include the chest wall. Um, again, I always like to have at least one image that includes a chest wall just to make sure that the text covered that area. Um, but again, not the entire, um, you don't need to see the lung and heart and everything in your image. So this is a case that illustrates that. A 53-year-old female presented with pain and swelling in the right breast. This was actually an overnight case that a resident had and the text saw some, what she said were maybe cysts or masses, she wasn't sure. Um, and the resident noticed right away that it was very abnormal looking. Um, so the resident actually went in and scanned. Um, you notice the depth of these two images are about three and a half and two, um, two centimeters deep. So he walked in and dropped the depth down to about five. And you can see um, there's this large irregular mass, um, obvious malignancy, a ton of skin thickening, very irregular. And this was a maximum intensity projection image of her MRI, uh, multicentric malignancy and um, ipsilateral, axillary ad ipsil ipsilateral axillary adenopathy. Um, the area of concern, it's important to note. So you want to know if it's something that feels superficial to the patient or deep. So this particular patient had a lot of pain and a palpable cord. Um, and if you remember from uh, board studying and things like that, the um, firm palpable cord in the breast, this was at three o'clock, seven centimeters from the nipple, uh, very typical from ondors. And if you know the clinical presentation, the specific area of concern, and it lines up with that, it fits perfectly. It can be very tender. So um, cine clips are really helpful. Um, this particular one demonstrates a common technique that you may have your text uh, perform, just um, doing some manual compression to see if the area is fluid. Um, and if it is, then you, you know that it's not a solid mass. It's more um, a fluctuant area of abscess. So that's very helpful if you can have that as well. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about um, ultrasound is make sure you're aware that the lesion echogenicity in the breast is related to subcutaneous fat. So just to review uh, basic sonographic breast anatomy, your skin is superficial, um, subcutaneous fat is right underneath, and then the mammary zone is just deep to that. Um, behind the mammary zone is the retromammary fat, and then the pectoralis muscle. Um, so when we perform evaluation, we wanna note those grayscale features and then also perform color Doppler evaluation. Um, these are two, two, two different lesions that may look similar on um, just grayscale. But when you put color flow on both of these lesions, the one on the top, you can see internal vascularity. It's very um, robust and vascular. The one on the bottom, peripheral vascularity. One is a solid mass, and then one is um, just an infected epidermal inclusion cyst. Um, again, you want to make sure your focal zone, depth settings, and site-specific areas are um, attention to each of these things. For instance, in this particular image, that same lesion that we just saw in the last picture um, that's right underneath the subcutaneous fat um, kind of blends in because you can see the lesions up here, but yet our focal zone is down several, um, a few centimeters below the area where it needs to be. So you don't want that in your image. Um, the breast emergencies. So mastitis and abscess are the most common. I'm sure you've seen a ton of these. 
Um, mastitis comes in different flavors. So there's lactation, uh, lactational uh, mastitis or abscess, and then um, non-lactational. Um, the most common with purple or lactational um, abscess is, a st is Staph aureus, the most common organism. Um, this is typically treated with antibiotics and percutaneous drainage. Very rarely um, incision and drainage is performed now. And then non-lactational, uh, that's what you see often. It's squamous metaplasia of the lactiferous ducts. They produce keratin, get clogged, they rupture, there's inflammation, and then can get infected. Um, and typically, uh, this is a mixed floor that causes it and ultimately may need fistula excision because they can form these tracts that um, drain up to in the periareal region. Um, mastitis, again, this is kind of a, a common appearance. In The patient presents typically with feverish chills, nausea, um, this is an example of mastitis, um, initially in a 24-year-old who was lactating. And then as you see, when she, she actually presented, um, kept coming back after failed courses of antibiotics. And then you can see this developing fluid collection. Um, and you can see it almost looks anechoic and then kind of becomes a little more heterogeneous. Um, finally then uh, formed a frank abscess, kind of drained up into the skin. Um, and this is the, the progression of how an abscess kind of develops. Um, abscesses, again, purple versus non-purple. Purple uh, are often peripheral, so this is kind of the typical appearance, this um, fluid collection right under the skin with some peripheral vascularity. And then non um can be peripheral or subareolar. The subareolar, which is more common, um, can be related to smoking, vitamin A deficiency. These are some images of the subareolar. And then peripheral can be related to trauma, epidermal inclusion cysts, people that are diabetic, um, steroid use or radiation or rheumatoid arthritis. And this is an example of an epidermal inclusion cyst. Um, trauma, again, could be a breast emergency. So you can have primary trauma to the breast. Um, this patient actually presented with uh, palpable abnormalities several um, months after a trauma, um, still came to the emergency department. And you can see these fluid collections with a surrounding echogenic tissue. This is fat necrosis. The final one with the calipers at the end is um, just uh, peripherally calcifying cal fat necrosis, completely benign. Um, again, this is just an image of incidental trauma to the breast. So shrapnel you can see in the lower inner quadrant of the left breast. Um, again, completely incidental, just happens to involve the breast. Um, if malignancy uh, presents to the, breath, to the emergency department, um, it can be life-threatening. So very, very uncommon that this happens, but for instance, this patient presented with a very large uh, breast mass, and you can see these two images. Um, if you get a picture that looks like this and it's very cloudy, you'll notice these um, bright echogenic, echogenic uh, areas and dirty shadowing in the um, sonographic images. And of course, um, you recognize that this is air. So this was an infected um, malignant necrotic tumor. Um, again, something that could be life-threatening. Um, and then another thing that can be life-threatening is hemorrhage. So this patient presented with um, feeling dizzy and weak. She carried her breast into the emergency department. Um, after contrast, you can see this uh, pooling of contrast in the posterior mass. Um, and of course, this was active extravasation, um, and she was actually embolized. So again, something that could potentially be life-threatening. Um, the terminology when you're reporting uh, these lesions, I won't go over all the BIRADS issues, but we'll talk about some special cases just so that you're aware. Um, the post-surgical fluid collections, Mondors, and pseudoaneurysms. So again, post-surgical fluid collections, uh, very common, could be infected or not infected. Mondors, we already saw. Um, again, that's one of the special conditions. The final one, um, pseudoaneurysms, you see elsewhere in the body. In the breast, they're typically due to um, a current procedure. More often, it's surgical than, um, than needle biopsy, but it could be either. Um, and just be aware that this may be something that presents to the emergency department. You always want to put um, color Doppler imaging. And when you put that on, you can see the typical appearance. This was a pseudoaneurysm that presented um, to our facility. Important things with reporting. So location is very important, the clock face distance from nipple. And this is important for follow-up purposes when the patient's seen out um, in the outside clinic, outpatient clinic. Um, remember with the clock face, it's like you're taking a clock and putting it directly on the breast. So this is how you would um, describe each breast finding. Um, the other thing that's important, you may be the only person that is reporting a cross-sectional exam on a patient that has malignancy. They may not be able to have any additional imaging because of their clinical status. So important things to be aware of. 
the axillary node levels. So this is just an example of that patient with that large necrotic mass we saw earlier. Um, you, it would be, it's helpful to the surgeons and to the team um, that you discuss the level of lymph node involvement if you can. Um, the pec minor is the, one, is the structure that differentiates the node levels. Lateral to the pec minor are the level one lymph nodes. Um, at the level of the pec minor are the level two lymph nodes. And medial to the medial border of the pec minor are the level three lymph nodes. The other uh, set of lymph nodes you want to be aware of are the internal mammary chain nodes. And they're often um, in involved in malignancy whenever these patients have large tumors. So really pay attention to the internal mammary chain when you're reading these reports. Um, who to call and how to follow up. Inpatient management is very rare. Typically, it's outpatient that um, we really need to pay attention to when patients present to the um, ER. So remember to document. And I put in an example here of a really good documentation that I saw um, that one of our radiologists um, put in her report. And she said, of note, this patient requires further outpatient evaluation. Ultrasound alone is not the standard of care for workup of breast abnormalities in patient, patients over 30. Um, and then she actually put the coordinator in the breast imaging clinic, their phone number, and then um, recommended mammography after discharge. And of course, you know, she called the, um, the clinician in the emergency department to tell them. So it's really important. Um, over 30, every patient should be having a mammogram with their diagnostic evaluation. So make sure to document that. In summary, the clinical history is the key. It can really help you in differentiating some of the breast issues that come into the emergency department. True breast emergencies are rare. Technique is very important with breast ultrasound and most of the techs in the ER are really um, inexperienced just because they don't do a lot of breast um, and aren't certified in breast. Um, ensure the entire breast is visualized from skin to chest wall in at least one image. Um, remember the axillary node levels and internal mammary nodes are important for the patient, um, especially down the road if she can't have additional imaging. Um, and remember that documentation and follow-up are crucial with breast exams. Patients over 30 are not adequately imaged without mammography. Um, these are my references, and thank you so much for uh, your time and having me.